There are a few ways to think about precision. While there are some relative fluctuations in these amounts, which I refer to as tolerance, knowing how it affects your designs, how you make them, and the final results can make a big difference in how your instrument looks and sounds. Whether you create these components manually from a blueprint or use a CNC milling machine like me, it's important to consider the level of precision needed, your own ability, and that of your tools, and whether any of these tolerances will impact the objectives you're aiming to achieve. Precision is optional in many parts of stringed instruments. Likewise, design elements are not critical to how the instrument plays and sounds. I set a high standard for myself, not because it's required, but because I enjoy contemplating how I will answer each of these questions in my distinct way and with my own flair. Please avoid confusing surface finish with precision. These are two separate concepts. Every surface has high and low points, and the variation between them determines its precision. It's important to note that a rough surface can actually be more flat than a polished surface. In my milling practices, I tend to err on the side of caution and take the time to create precise parts. I utilize shallow step downs and step overs and multiple finishing paths to achieve this. If you're interested in exploring how I go about the CNC milling of these parts, I share the Fusion 360 files with all the 3D models, CAD and CAM of the builds on this channel with my Patreon members for $1 a month. It's a great way to get me to make more videos like this one and learn a little bit more about my process as well. Check the link in the description. Now that I've removed the parts from the CNC, I can start the process of hand finishing them. I'll be using 400 grit and only sanding until all of the tool marks are removed. This is the stage where the surface finish and precision surface come together. The amount of material removed in this process is incredibly small. To avoid altering the flatness of the part, it's critical to use a sturdy sanding block and only sand until the tool marks are uniformly removed. This will ensure that the flat surfaces stay flat. Although I'm eager to see what this device can do, it's essential to proceed with caution and take things slowly and methodically. There's a risk of making a significant error at this stage, which could lead to the need for repairs, so it's crucial to maintain a steady and deliberate pace. carefully sand the feet of the bridge and ensure they are in the correct position according to the scale length. Afterward, I use a scraper to remove additional material from the designated spots. With any luck, these areas will gradually expand until the bridge fits perfectly. The contrast between CNC milling and this kind of precision handwork is fascinating. Throughout history, humans have been deeply interested in achieving precise work and have devoted significant time and effort to developing techniques for this purpose. This fascination with precision is ingrained in our nature, driving us to continually seek opportunities to learn and practice these skills.
When making a nut, there are some interesting things to consider. Firstly, the material used must be carefully chosen based on its material properties and how it will be used. I prefer to use elk antler as it is sustainably sourced from shed gathering. I've been using this one side of an elk rack for a few years. The material is very similar to ivory and can be challenging to work with. But I've discovered some tricks and recently acquired a new tool that makes it much more manageable. If you're anything like me, and I think you are, you watch a bunch of blacksmithing videos mixed in with the engineering, math, science, and luthery content we all love. I've been looking at these 72 inch belt grinders and considering picking one up. I'd never buy a tool for just one job, and as luck would have it, this tool has many messy uses. Shaping the elk antler nut is a breeze with this setup. It can all be done by hand with files and sandpaper, but this method is easy, satisfying, efficient, and accurate. One side of this material will be more porous than the other. I fill this area with thin Starbond CA glue. There's a link in the description if you need to pick some up. I also bias the non-porous side away from the fretboard and upper surface and attempt to keep this porous layer as thin as possible. There are pieces with a thick solid layer and pieces that are thin. Using the material like this allows me to use much more of this valuable stock without sacrificing functionality or tone. I enjoyed discussing the material properties and practicing the art and science of luthery, the precision, and the techniques of the craft with you, and I hope you do as well. I do my best to produce a video each week, and if you would be so kind as to subscribe, you will, without a doubt, enjoy what's to come. Thanks for watching.